foreign policy spending bills. This panel is chaired by California Representative David Dreyer. It's about an hour. Committee will come to order. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> we're here today for, for the opportunity to, to uh, take testimony from uh, my very good friends, the distinguished chairman of the Committee on International Relations and the ranking minority member, my fellow Californian classmate and neighbor, Mr. Lantos. And um, we're considering the Foreign Relations Authorization Act for 2004 and 2005. We obviously are going to be discussing a wide range of issues, and I know this is a sweeping piece of legislation, uh, but I would like to begin by uh, mentioning one particular issue, which I know my friend from California, Mr. Lantos, is going to mention, um, and that is uh, legislation that he and I introduced entitled the United States International Leadership Act. and. Um, it's legislation that aims to strengthen and improve the relationship between the United States of America and the United Nations. We introduced this legislation uh, to try and address uh, this very pressing concern that we've observed over the past several years, and it emanates from a task force of the Council on Foreign Relations that our former colleague and your predecessor, Mr. Hyde, Lee Hamilton, and I uh, chaired dealing with the challenge of enhancing the U.S. leadership role in the United Nations. And I believe that the package that we've put together that is included as part of this bill is uh, very important as we pursue that goal. So let me say that I look forward to hearing uh, not only from the chairman and ranking minority member, but from our uh, very distinguished witnesses who will be coming forward to uh, offer their thoughts on this critically important piece of legislation. And if no one else has any other uh, statements, let me begin by calling on uh, my very good friend, as I said, the distinguished chairman of the Committee on International Relations, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hyde. This clashes with my innate humility. I just soon whisper, you know. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thanks for scheduling this hearing and giving us the opportunity to request a rule for the House to consider our work product. This is truly a bipartisan bill. On May 16, 2003, the Committee on International Relations reported favorably H.R. 1950, the Foreign Relations Authorization Act, for 2004 and 2005. This is a major bill, if not the major bill. It's certainly one of the major bills of our committee. It authorizes funding for the State Department to support both its domestic and overseas operations. In addition, the bill authorizes security assistance programs and activities. The overall funding level in this bill is just over $15 billion. Specific activity authorized under this bill include continued embassy security enhancements and security readiness, hiring and training of personnel, and continued modernization of the department's technology and communication system. It also provides funding for the U.S. international broadcasting. A significant initiative is the authorization of $30 million for Middle East Television Network. The fiscal 03 Supplemental Appropriations Bill provided the startup funds for this program, and this bill continues support for a new effort to reach audiences in the Middle East. Division B, B of the bill, the Defense Trade and Security Assistance Reform Act of 2003, supports anti-terrorism efforts by expanding the prohibitions in the Arms Control Act on arms-related transactions with state sponsors of international terrorism and other countries such as the People's Republic of China. 
which are embargoed under U.S. law from receiving military equipment. These provisions also increase the penalties for persons who violate our restrictions on arms trade with such countries and strengthen the ability of U.S. law enforcement to enforce criminal violations of our laws in these areas. These measures countered the trend to liberalize sensitive exports, which began in the previous administration. The increased threats to our country demand that we strengthen, not relax, military export controls. As the committee knows, Mr. Lantos and I have filed an amendment that establishes the Millennium Challenge account and authorizes funding for the Peace Corps. This amendment is nearly identical to legislation which we recently reported, and it's our desire to pass the MCA and Peace Corps initiative as part of our State Department authorization. The Senate is moving along the same path, and this should lead to a productive conference committee. The amendment establishing the MCA authorizes the expansion of United States economic assistance to a limited number of high-performing countries in the developing world. Instead of foreign assistance as a means of promoting multilateral objectives or supporting U.S. diplomatic or geopolitical goals, this new form of assistance will be performance-based and will require a proven track record of accomplishment by potential recipients in the areas of economic freedom, democracy, and investments in a country's people, principally in the health and education sectors. The program, if implemented, will be above and beyond existing aid and will distribute U.S. economic aid to developing countries that are determined to, in the words of the President, govern justly, invest in their people, and encourage economic <coughs> freedom. The President has requested $1.3 billion for the MCA in his fiscal 2004 budget, and our amendment is consistent with the President's request. Our amendment also supports the President's proposal to expand the size of the Peace Corps to 14,000 volunteers by fiscal 2007 and authorizes this important program for fiscal 2004 through fiscal 2007, consistent with the four-year expansion as requested and proposed by the President. The administration's request for the Peace Corps for fiscal 2004 is $359 million, and the bill authorizes $8.8 .8 million over the administration request in order to provide for increased deployment of the Crisis Corps and to increase the monthly readjustment allowances for an increased Peace Corps in fiscal 2004. I appreciate the committee taking the time to hear our request. I certainly leave it to your good judgment to craft a fair and equitable rule for this important legislation, and I am pleased to yield to my good friend, Mr. Landers, whose cooperation is sterling. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hyde, for the very thoughtful testimony, and thanks for the vote of confidence in our uh, judgment level here uh, in the Rules Committee. Uh, not every committee chairman uh, comes to the same conclusion that you have, but I very much uh, appreciate the fact that you have such high regard for this committee. And I'm happy to uh, now recognize, as I said, my uh, good friend and neighbor and classmate who has just marked his 53rd wedding anniversary. And so I'd like the record to show how pleased uh, we are that Annette Lantos has survived 53 years of marriage to Tom Lantos. So with that, uh, we look forward to your testimony. Well, I join you in saluting my beloved wife. Well, for that reason, you should turn the microphone on. I am happy to join you in, in saluting Mrs. Landers for her heroic achievement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I very much appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and the other distinguished members of the committee regarding H.R. 1950, the Foreign Relations Authorization Bill for fiscal years 2004 and 2005, and I ask that my full statement be made part of the record. Mr. Chairman, this is an excellent bill, and I'm very proud to have had the privilege of co-sponsoring it with my 
very dear friend, the distinguished chairman of the committee, Mr. Hyde. It fully funds the Department of State, furthers United States efforts to communicate more clearly with the rest of the world, and it helps protect us from the scourge of ballistic missiles. My prepared testimony goes into the bill in detail. Much of it has already been described by the chairman of the committee, and I obviously will not repeat his comments, although I fully concur in them. I must mention, however, Mr. Chairman, that I am particularly proud to have worked with you in crafting one key provision of this bill, the International Leadership Act of 2003, which has been included in this bill. The Leadership Act is designed to give our diplomats the tools they need to ensure that America once again punches at its weight class at the United Nations, including through the creation of a democracy caucus to support the United States at the United Nations. Uh, I have found it appalling and almost incomprehensible that Libya, for instance, should become chairman of the UN Human Rights Commission, and the United States should be booted off the, the UN Human Rights Commission. And I, I earnestly hope uh, that um, our provision in this bill will help rectify this outrageous and inappropriate situation. Mr. Chairman, our legislation includes an amendment sponsored by my good friend from New York, Mr. Crowley, relating to the U.S. contribution to the United Nations Population Fund. I hope that this important amendment, fully debated in the committee, is left undisturbed. If the committee addresses this matter, however, I hope it does so in a fair way that allows the whole House to have a clear vote on it. Secondly, Mr. Chairman, the legislation also includes an amendment by Mr. Menendez of New Jersey, adopted by our committee, that addresses global climate change, a very real threat to our national security. Mr. Chairman, as you know, the Energy and Commerce Committee took a different position on this matter, and I understand that this committee intends to adopt that committee's position and strike Mr. Menendez's provision from the base text of the bill. If so, in the interest of fairness and to retain the committee, which has been the hallmark of our work in the International Relations Committee, I strongly urge the committee to make an amendment by Mr. Menendez on this matter in order so that the whole House can debate and choose between the differing positions of the two committees. I also understand that Mr. Ballinger has filed an amendment to strike his second-degree amendment on immigration from Mexico, which was originally also sponsored by Mr. Menendez. If this amendment prevails, the bill, the bill would be silent on this issue. Again, in the interest of fairness, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would request the committee to make Mr. Menendez's original amendment in order to allow the whole House to discuss this matter. Third, Mr. Chairman, I understand that an amendment has been filed to overturn the President's initiative to rejoin UNESCO by cutting all funding for that organization. Mr. Chairman, this position has already been firmly rejected by our committee, and UNESCO membership was supported by the full House when the State Department authorization legislation was considered in the last Congress. I do not think we should waste the time of the House in rehashing this stale debate. The President of the United States has decided to rejoin this organization. The First Lady is fully committed to our initiative. I believe the committee should support the President and the committee and not make such an amendment in order. We are still reviewing the amendments, but there are also a number of worthy amendments, including amendments by Mr. Ackerman, Ms. Maloney, that I hope the committee will see fit to make in order. Finally, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Hyde and I have filed an amendment with the committee that constitutes the text of H.R. 2441, the Millennium Challenge Assistance Authorization 
and Peace Corps Expansion Act of 2003. While this is a major initiative, we finished complex negotiations with the White House and the number of interested members only after we reported our H.R. 1950, and it properly belongs as part of this legislation. I respectfully request, Mr. Chairman, that this amendment be made in order, and I urge the committee to adopt the process by which other members of the committee have their amendments made in order. Mr. Chairman, once again, I want to thank the chairman of the International Relations Committee, my very dear friend from Illinois, for working with me and all the other members of our committee in crafting a very good and very bipartisan bill. Virtually every element of our bill has the support of both Republicans and Democrats. This is in major part due to the leadership uh, of Chairman Hyde, and I want to thank him publicly for the open, collegial, and statesmanlike manner in which he has brought this very complex bill through our committee. It is a privilege to be serving with him, and I am grateful for his uh, support and friendship. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lantos, and let me uh, again express my congratulations to both of you for uh, a very fine work product and your, your thoughts on the uh, different amendments and the issues that came forward uh, during the debate in your committee. Um, I, uh, I think that our package that we have is uh, a very important one if we look at this big picture of the U.S. leadership role in the United Nations and uh, a lot of items that really uh, are common sense. And when we did the study on this, when, when Mr. Hamilton and I co-chaired this task force for the Council on Foreign Relations, it really came as a shock that so many of these things are not taken into consideration. You correctly point to the uh, issue of the United States being kicked off in the area of human rights and Libya presiding over human rights priorities there. And so I think that this package will go a long way towards addressing those kinds of concerns and do exactly what we want, and that is to enhance our leadership role. Uh, you mentioned the, um, the Menendez uh, Amendment as it relates to uh, the uh, immigration issue, and one of the things uh, that I've done, I've filed an amendment along with my colleague Charles Stenholm to, uh, to deal with that, that issue and, in fact, reinsert the language uh, deleting the so-called Ballinger language that was uh, included in there. And I would hope that as we pursue that in a bipartisan way that, uh, that the minority would end up being supportive of that effort as well. Uh, so I just, again, want to thank both of you for the extraordinary leadership role that you've played on this and a wide range of other issues, and look forward to consideration of this measure on the floor. Mr. Goss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, join your comments in applauding the leadership of the committee. Uh, obviously, it's a very sorry world. There are sore spots everywhere. Uh, we are the last nation of capability to do much about it in many instances. We are asked to do a great many things, uh, and it is very hard to know which are the most important things, and I appreciate your efforts in this bill to bring those things to our attention. One of the questions I wanted to ask is whether or not you have treated the subject of universal jurisdiction in your bill or know of any amendments about it. I, <clears throat> excuse me, we have not treated that subject and I know of no amendments. The reason I uh, ask is because uh, we did take some effort on behalf of, uh, I believe, on another piece of legislation to send a message to the Belgian government that we felt that the way their law was working uh, was unsatisfactory and suggested that it could stand either some improvement or uh, being retired. And I understand they have, in fact, uh, altered the law yet again so that the universal jurisdiction question has now been um, limited to just people who are either citizens of Belgium or people who have been residents in Belgium for three consecutive years, uh, which I think is a huge improvement. It is a matter of some concern as we go about our business, as you know, with the international organizations, NATO being there and others. Uh, that we create an unnecessary liability for mischief makers who would take advantage of that law as we have seen in the past. I fully agree with you, Mr. Goss. Uh, I think the Belgian government and the Belgian parliament has recognized their earlier mistakes. They are taking corrective action, which is long overdue. 
Thank you very much. I congratulate you on good legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, first of all, I, I too want to express my appreciation to both uh, Chairman Hyde and Ranking Member Lantos for their work on this legislation and specifically on their work to establish the Millennium Challenge account. Um, although only time will tell, I'm hopeful that this will be one of the most important and ambitious new foreign policy initiatives uh, undertaken by the United States to help lift countries out of poverty. And I know that's something that both of you have been very much concerned with for many years. Uh, I believe you and your committee members uh, have actually improved upon the President's initial proposal, and I understand that your bill is supported by the administration and by many non-governmental development and humanitarian organizations that are engaged in anti-poverty programs around the world. Uh, this bill focuses on assistance to low-income countries, uh, has a strong emphasis on the role of women in the designing and carrying out of these programs. Uh, and gives careful attention to coordinating uh, MCA programs with our existing USAID priorities. And so I, you're both to be highly commended for your leadership on this bill, but I would like to, to raise a couple of concerns, however, and, and hopefully you can pro provide me some additional information to put my mind at ease. My first concern is over the funding of the Mill Millennium Challenge account. Uh, initially, the Congress was told by the President that the MCA funds would be in addition to current funding levels for development, food assistance and anti-poverty programs. Uh, we would not like to end up robbing Peter to pay Paul and, uh, and end up with a zero net increase in our development programs. Later, however, it appears that these funds will be included within the budget caps in direct competition um, with existing foreign aid and development programs. And, 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 and frankly, I, you know, I'm, I'm tired of authorizing programs that either don't receive full funding or rob Peter to pay Paul uh, and take money from other critical programs. So I would find it helpful to hear from you both uh, about what is your understanding for the record of how funding for these programs is to be found and allocated. I don't have any answer to that other than my uh, uh, solid conviction that this is additional, this is new money. Okay. And this is not to be taken from other funds. Okay. Uh, that's the way it was represented to us, and that's on that basis we, we passed it. I would be very distressed if that weren't the situation. I fully share the chairman's view. That was the basis on which uh, our committee dealt with this issue. That was the basis on which our committee members voted for this very important measure and we fully intend to fight for full funding. I appreciate it. That's very helpful. Just one other, one other issue that's, um, I understand that Section 307 of H.R. 2441 is reported out by the International Relations Committee and now incorporated into H.R. 1950, the Foreign Relations Authorization Act, authorize, authorizes the Millennium, Ch Millennium Challenge Corporation to allocate or transfer to USAID or any other federal department or agency funds to help carry out the purposes of the Millennium Challenge account. And I'm a, I'm a little concerned and a little bit disappointed that the U.S. Department of Agriculture is not specifically named in this section of the bill or the accompanying report, as USAID is actually specifically noted. And I'm a, even more disappointed that the report language referencing the George McGovern Robert Dole International Food for Education and Child Nutrition Program as an established poverty and hunger reducing program uh, apparently was stricken uh, by the majority staff from the uh, final r report language or the draft report language. And I want, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to both of you because you, both of you played a very important role in establishing this program to begin with, along with some other members of your committee, Mr. B. Ryder and Mr. Leach, our former colleague, Mr. Gilman. And I do, I do, not, do not believe that the McGovern Dole program would have even happened without your intervention. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled and dismayed that USDA's food aid, humanitarian and development programs are not referenced like USAID is referenced uh, in this legislation and in the report. And I'm also kind of puzzled that the, uh, that apparently uh, there was an effort to just strike the reference to the McGovern Dole program. So Mr. Chairman and Mr. Lantos, perhaps uh, you can shed some light on the matter for me and, and perhaps more importantly help us kind of remedy this oversight by returning the references to US, uh, USDA and, and the McGovern Dole, Dole program, either in the bill or at least in the committee report language accompanying the bill, because uh, 
I mean, I, th I think this is exactly the kind of program that we want to make sure doesn't get overlooked. Um, uh, Mr. McGovern, yeah, sure. we have not filed our report. I am advised by staff, and there can be some insertions okay. of la the language that you're uh, Well, that, that I'd be very grateful for that, and I appreciate I'll ask the staff to talk yeah. to you. And Thank you. I appreciate that. Work something I, I fully support the chairman's position. I think both Senator McGovern and Senator Dole fully merit inclusion, at least in the report language, and the programs fully deserve our support. Well, I, I appreciate both of you willing to work with us on that. And I th again, thank you for your work on, on this bill and on the Millennium Challenge account. Thank you. Mr. Lender. Thank you. Mr. Hayes. Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, only have one question for both our witnesses. And I, like everyone else, uh, I would associate myself with the remarks complimenting uh, the chairman and the ranking member for the extraordinary work of uh, putting together what I uh, know will be uh, a bipartisan Foreign Relations Authorization Act. And having served on the International Relations Committee with uh, both these gentlemen, I can attest to um, uh, their extraordinary efforts in trying to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to have input. Toward that end, I guess, Mr. Chairman, and um, uh, my good friend, the ranking member, we, we are here basically for the purpose of granting a rule for floor consideration. And while I'm mindful that both of you have indicated that there are amendments that you consider worthy, and I have no reason to disagree with any of those suggestions. Um, uh, would it be um, uh, uh, that either or both of you would agree uh, that we should have an open rule on such an important uh, matter, such that all members, uh, I now have, uh, I was up to 77, and here comes some more paper, um, uh, uh, potential amendments. And it just seems uh, that working the will of the body would allow that we would have an open rule. And I'd just be interested in um, uh, the extraordinary bipartisan efforts you all have put forward, how you uh, uh, would have us fashion um, uh, the um, measure that goes to the floor uh, on a rule. Well, the decision to have an open rule or a modified closed rule or whatever kind of rule is strictly up to the Rules Committee, and I would I would dread to. <laughs> to oh, but Mr. Chairman, if I may, we know that. But what would be your recommendation is what I'm asking. Whether, you, whether we do what you say or not, uh, you know, they don't ever do what I say. So uh, my point is, what would you say about it? My, and if, if my, you came here and said I'd want an open rule, I'll guarantee you it will influence the chairman and other members. As far as I'm concerned, every major idea uh, that somebody has ought to be debated and voted on. But um, <clears throat> when you're on the floor and you have 78 <laughs> amendments, many of which are redundant and uh, <clears throat> not always uh, designed to advance the, uh, the, uh, the cause, whatever that may be, uh, I, I would leave it to the judgment of the Rules Committee. That's why we have a Rules Committee, uh, to make those decisions. They're hard decisions. They're not easy. They're tough. But um, my, re my <clears throat> remembrance of open rules when I was in the minority is uh, rather, rather light, rather dim. I can appreciate that. I think I hear out of that a modified closed rule. But <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Before recognizing uh, Mr. diaz Bellart, let me uh, just say in response to Mr. Hastings, I think that the remarks that Chairman Hyde has made are really on target. As I've gone through this amendment, there are a number of redundant amendments. And as was the case uh, when our party was in the minority, we will uh, work to ensure that virtually every issue is addressed. And I think it's fair to conclude that we will have some kind of structure this rule, as has always been the case, because there's so many amendments that have been filed. But we do want to ensure that every issue uh, does, in fact, have an opportunity to be heard on the House floor. So I just want to assure. 
No, no, it won't be a modified closed rule. It will, it will, what, what I will tell you right now, what we would plan to do is have a structured rule that will allow for the consideration of all these measures. A modified closed rule would, in fact, prevent the opportunity for a wide range of issues to be considered. So we will be looking towards a, a structured rule on this. Yeah. Well, we do want uh, the issues to be cons addressed here. Mr. diaz Uh Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, um, first of all, I, I want to thank the Chairman and the Ranking Member. I, I have extraordinary respect and, and admiration for, for both of you uh, and uh, consider it an, an honor to, to serve, to be able to serve with both of you. Uh, and um, so thank you for your hard work. I know just seeing the the amendments that uh, Mr. Hastings and the Chairman have made reference to uh, gives one an idea of the amount of work and the uh, sophistication and complexity of the work that you must have dealt with in bringing forth this product. Uh, it's most impressive and obviously very important. Um, and I appreciate Mr. Hastings bringing up the issue of uh, the amount of amendments that we've received because we have a, a difficult task now to, to, to make this a, a a fair process, while at the same time, obviously, uh, uh, one that uh, allows the House to, to move forward with its work. And so um, uh, I, found, I found the, the comment, uh, the comments that arose from the question of Mr. Hastings extremely helpful, Mr. Chairman, as well as uh, yours, and, uh, and have no, no questions at this time. Mr. Mr. Chairman, before we secure um, Mr. Lantos has been extraordinarily generous in complimenting me. I think the two of us want to compliment our staffs, both minority and majority. In a bill as complicated as this, there are hours of negotiation, discussion, draftsmanship that go on between the staffs. And while we're both on, in different parties, the product that both Tom and I take credit for you so generously bestow on us is an awful lot of blood, sweat, and tears of the staff. Well, it's very true, and I, I'll just say I that I, I know that, uh, of course you do, and, uh, and members of the Rules Committee staff have been working very closely with your right. committee staff as well to try and address not only the priority concerns that I personally move forward, but the overall concerns to address the issue that Mr. Hastings uh, of Florida appropriately uh, raised for us to ensure that we have uh, an opportunity to consider a wide range of issues. Mr. Hastings of Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no questions other than to congratulate both of you. I think in, in the times that we are in, this had to be an extraordinarily difficult piece of legislation to, to put through and to, uh, to balance all of the interests that are out there and to have it come out of committee with this, such strong bipartisan support. Uh, I think is a credit to both of you and Mr. Chairman, as you said, properly to your staff. So I just want to add my, my uh, voice of uh, congratulations to both of you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We look forward to uh, consideration of your measure. And now we'll proceed with hearing from the authors of those multifarious amendments that we uh, have just been discussing. Our next witness is the uh, distinguished chairman of the Committee on Veterans Affairs, my uh, classmate and uh, great human rights activist with whom I've been privileged to work on a wide range of issues, sometimes on the same side, over the uh, past couple of decades, Mr. Smith, and we're happy to have you. And without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record in their entirety, and we welcome a summary. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, let me return that compliment. We have worked together on so many issues, from Central America to other uh, important human rights and humanitarian interests, and uh, I applaud you for the good work you have done over these many years. And I want to thank uh, Chairman Hyde uh, and Mr. Lantos uh, very briefly. This is a very good bipartisan piece of legislation. But I would just say uh, I'm asking for the opportunity to offer on behalf of Mr. Oberstar of Minnesota and Mr. Hyde, Chairman Hyde, and myself an amendment that would strike the aforementioned um, uh, Crowley Amendment, which seeks to gut a, an 18-year-old law known as the Kemp-Kasten uh, language. 
traditionally carried in the Appropriations Bill, the Foreign Ops Appropriations Bill, uh, since 1985. This legislation uh, bars U.S. taxpayer funding from going to any organization that, that uh, co-manages or supports or participates in the management of a coercive population control program. Regrettably, Mr. Crowley, in a very narrow vote in the committee, uh, put in language that says that those who would be a part of this would have to knowingly and intentionally uh, be a part of it. Well, the UN Population Fund since 1979 has applauded, has cheerleaded for, has been the most aggressive backers of the Chinese program uh, year in and year out, always claiming that the program is voluntary. Now, it's pretty hard to get knowingly and intentional when the organization is there on the ground, continues to say uh, over and over again uh, that it's a voluntary program. It is not. Brothers and sisters are illegal in China. Uh, you need to get, if you are a wife or a mother uh, and you hope to have a baby or you're pregnant with a child, uh, if it's not a birth allowed, uh, which is what they call it, uh, that child uh, will cost you anywhere from three to six times the combined salaries of both husband and wife. Unwed mothers, they don't exist in China unless they have their children on the run. Only married couples can have uh, children. The others are killed uh, routinely by the state. They also have recently, 1995, passed a comprehensive draconian eugenics law. So that any child that perhaps uh, uh, has a parent or two that may have some other deficiency, mental or otherwise, uh, that child is subjected to an abortion as well. Regrettably, the UNFPA has been complicit in these crimes. I'm hoping for the, along with Mr. Hyde and Mr. Uh, 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 gentleman from Minnesota, uh, Mr. Oberstar, are just seeking the opportunity to strike that language from the bill. Um, I yield to any questions. Thank you very much. You've made it very clear, Mr. Smith. Mr. Lender. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I, of course, I want to say to the gentleman that I, uh, I admire a lot of the work that he does on, on human rights, and uh, there's a lot of things that we do agree on. Uh, this is one area where uh, our opinion of the uh, UNFPA, I think, is, uh, is different. I mean, I, I, you know, it's interesting to note that uh, President Bush put together a blue ribbon team uh, sent to China to investigate. Uh, so this Chinese coercion have found no evidence that the UNFPA has knowingly supported or participated in the management of a program of coercive abortion or sterilization in China. And in fact, the President's own team recommended the U.S. immediately release uh, funding for the UNFPA. So uh, I, uh, I mean, I, we, we, we could debate all this on, on, the, house, on the House floor, if, uh, but I, uh, you know, I respectfully disagree with the, with the gentleman. And Mr. Chairman, at this point, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to uh, submit to the record the statement by Congressman uh, Joseph Crowley, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your being Appreciate here, and uh, thanks for your thoughts on this. Thank you. Our next witness is the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. And we're happy to have you, Brad. Please come forward. And without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record in their entirety. And we'd welcome a summary. Thank you for uh, your time. I applaud the chairman of the, our full committee in saying that uh, every major concept uh, should get uh, discussion on the floor, and at the same time, we shouldn't deal with uh, redundant amendments. I come here with a redundant amendment. That is to say, I have two amendments dealing with Iran, and I hope that you make the first one in order, and th then you won't have to make an order unless you want to the second uh, fallback amendment. The uh, First Amendment is structured after a bill that uh, I introduced uh, about a month ago uh, called the Iran Freedom and Democracy Support Act. Uh, in the last several months, the world has watched Iran develop nuclear weapons on the one hand, which is an unhelpful sign, and at the same time we've seen student demonstrations and other indications that perhaps we'll see a, uh, a peaceful change in the policies of that regime. Uh, what the, uh, my First Amendment would do, and it is structured after H.R. 2466, is to provide support for broadcasting into Iran, surprise, provide support 
for uh, the um, uh, pro-democracy forces uh, trying to bring democracy to Iran. It would reimpose the embargo that existed until the year 2000 on all non-energy exports from Iran to the United States. It would authorize the President to deal with a very difficult situation we have vis-a-vis -vis the World Bank. The World Bank has recently lent $200 million to the government in Tehran. And I'm, uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, a strong supporter of American foreign aid. But I have to go back to Los Angeles, as, as you do, and explain why an agency that gets roughly 25 percent of its money from U.S. taxpayers is sending those dollars to uh, what is arguably the most threatening of the three axis of evil countries. And so uh, this would authorize the President to uh, take funds that would otherwise go to the World Bank and instead use them for child survival and HIV AIDS programs. Because I support foreign aid, uh, I wouldn't want to reduce the amount of that foreign aid, but it may have to be redirected to some of the most important uh, programs we have. Finally, uh, the amendment requires the President to report to Congress on Ara Iran's alleged harboring of uh, terrorists uh, associated with Al Qaeda. So the amendment represents a four-pronged approach in changing our policy uh, toward Iran. It has 18 co-sponsors, including the gentleman uh, who was sitting in this chair immediately before myself. I talked to uh, Mr. Lantos on the way out. He wants to add his voice to those who would like to see this, uh, uh, this amendment uh, come before the full House as part of this bill. The backup amendment uh, is a sense of Congress uh, about what our policy and concern should be toward Iran. It is virtually identical to some language that was added to the Senate bill on the Senate floor uh, by Senator Brownback. Uh, I, as I say, in an effort to avoid redundancy, I hope very much that you make the more substantive amendment uh, in order. Um, I'm told by my staff that the uh, that Chairman One uh, could be subject to some arguable uh, uh, germaneness question. Uh, so I hope that you not only make it in order, but uh, eliminate any uh, points of order against it. Thank so you very much, Mr. Those. Chairman. Thank we you. appreciate your being here, and thanks for your uh, for your proposal, Mr. Goss, Mr. McGovern, Mr. Linder, Mr. Hastings, Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much for being here, Brad. We appreciate it. Our next witness is uh, another Californian, our colleague, Mr. Rohrabacher. And he does not appear to be here. Our next uh, witness is the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel. And he does not appear to be here. Next, we go back to a very able Californian, my uh, colleague, Mr. Schiff, with whom I'm privileged to represent the Los Angeles area. And Adam, welcome to the Rules Committee. We're happy to have you. Thank you, Mr. Rumor Chairman. Rumor has it you did a great job on the Fox News Channel the other night burying your opponent. Uh, I was and so watching I, the master, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, great. So we're happy to have you. And let me say that without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record in their entirety. And we welcome your summary. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Members, I have two amendments uh, to advocate for, and I'll be very brief. Uh, the first is an amendment uh, that uh, voices congressional support for an investigation into assertions that Iraq attempted to obtain uranium from, Iraq, from Africa. Um, this uh, is based on a Senate amendment that has been adopted that was offered uh, a bipartisan amendment by Senators Luger, Durbin, Roberts, Rockefeller, uh, and many others, uh, that there should be an investigation into this issue. Uh, earlier in May, the um, chair and ranking member or chair and vice chair of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence asked the inspector generals of the Department of State and the CIA to undertake this investigation. Uh, so this is an investigation that uh, we assume is already ongoing. Uh, but the benefit of speaking in both the Senate and the House in support of this uh, is to encourage uh, full cooperation with the inspection, with the investigation being done by the IGs. The results of that uh, uh, investigation will be reported to the House and Senate Select Committees on Intelligence, as well as the House and Senate Foreign Affairs and International Relations Committee. I think will be a value, value to the good work that Mr. Goss, Ms. Harmon, and the members of that committee are doing, as well as uh, to those of us that are on the International Relations Committee. Uh, the resolution 
uh, expresses the sense of Congress that the investigation should be completed by September of this year, that the findings should be unclassified to the maximum extent possible while fully protecting any intelligence sources or methods. Uh, and the conclusions would be sent to the committees that I enumerated before. Uh, Congress uh, made the most important decision it can make to authorize the use of force, uh, not uh, simply on the basis of this assertion, certainly, but uh, in large part on the basis of intelligence over Iraq's weapons programs. Uh, and I think that uh, getting to the bottom of how this assertion uh, percolated up to the State of the Union would be valuable to the public and to the committees with responsive, uh, responsible jurisdiction. Uh, that's the, the first amendment. Um, the second amendment uh, is a sense of Congress that to the extent possible and consistent with national security objectives, the U.S. should expedite the process of granting visas to Rus Russian weapons scientists involved in arms control and nonproliferation in the United States. Delays and difficulties in implementation of nonproliferation and threat reduction programs are emerging because of some of the tightened U.S. visa regulations. Uh, these uh, increases in security and visas were inevitable, they were desirable, uh, but they cannot be allowed to come at the cost of larger national security interests. Uh, and to the extent that we can ensure national security on the one hand and we can facilitate allowing these, sentence, uh, these scientists to uh, work with their American counterparts on nonproliferation, uh, we ought to undertake that effort. Uh, and this amendment would uh, express the sense of Congress that we really need to meet both objectives. Thank you very much, Mr. Schiff. You've explained the uh, amendments very well, and uh, I have no questions. Mr. Goss? Not at all. I think the explanation is clear. I would assure Mr. Schiff that uh, the committees that do have the jurisdiction, I think, are pursuing it right now. Thank you. Which is uh, what I assured him on television the other night, as I uh, recall. Mr. Hastings. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Linder. Mr. Hastings, thank you very much for being here, Adam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the consideration of this. Uh, we, uh, as I said, I called Mr. Rohrbacher and Mr. Engel, and uh, neither of them appear to be here from the Committee on International Relations Committee. So uh, we'll move ahead to the Committee on Armed Services, and we're happy to welcome a very good friend from Indiana, Mr. Hostetler. Please come forward, and without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the uh, record, and we would welcome a summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Rules Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the amendment that I uh, come to request to be considered by the Rules Committee is an amendment uh, that will uh, authorize the Secretary of State to regulate the issuance of consular identification cards uh, by foreign missions in the U.S. Recently, in my uh, subcommittee, which I chair, the House Immigration, Border Security and Claims Subcommittee, uh, the FBI has made disclosures with regard to security problems with the cards uh, that call into question the ability to protect the American people from criminal and terrorist threats. Now, consular ID cards have been, have been issued for over 100 years in this country uh, from foreign agents uh, whose nationals are here. Uh, and they have been usually for the purpose of uh, uh, communicating with the foreign missions here of that of that national should their concern uh, arise. However, uh, over the last couple of years, uh, as a result of lobbying by foreign missions of state and locales uh, to accept the cards and uh, a change in policy from uh, consulates, the uh, the number uh, has ballooned to over one and a half million issued in the last two years. However, these cards are neither secure nor reliable, as the for Forensic D Document Laboratory at the uh, Bureau of Immigration's Customs Enforcement, the new uh, BICE, has stated in a report that uh, in order to obtain a Mexican uh, matricula consular card, uh, their version of the consular ID card, uh, it is, quote, readily available by presenting minimal supporting documentation and submission of a nominal fee. Uh, at a hearing before a subcommittee, uh, earlier this year, the FBI told us that the uh, matricula is not a reliable form of identification, that in fact uh, individuals have been arrested with as many as seven uh, different matricula in their possession, each bearing their photo but with different names, uh, and is not, is not uh, uh, limited to Mexican nationals, especially given the fact that one of the individuals that, that received the card and was seen was... Uh, obtained in their, in their uh, possession was an Iranian national. 
and testimony before our subcommittee, uh, they explained that domestic acceptance of unreliable foreign documents, such as the consular ID cards in question, endangers our national security and poses a criminal and terrorist threat. Unlike passports that are governed by international standards, such as uh, the, the UN organization, International Civil Aviation Organization, which, which governs the, the uh, issuance of and the, the production of uh, passports, um, U.S. law enforcement must rely on foreign officials uh, to confirm that, that the cards are indeed valid. In fact, Mexico has no database that, uh, of the cards and the individuals to which the cards have been, have been issued. This uh, amendment would require that the Secretary of State would regulate the issuance of consular identification cards in our country. It would make sure that uh, the cards were issued only to consular, only to bona fide nationals of their countries. It would make, they would uh, be required, foreign missions would be required to maintain accurate records of the cards they've issued, and they would have to uh, uh, direct recipients of the cards to notify the consulate if there is a change of address. Foreign governments uh, would also have to give notice to the Secretary of uh, issuing consular ID cards in the United States, including names and addresses of the recipients. And the amendment would also give the Secretary of State and the IG of the Department of State uh, access to records of the consular cards that have been, uh, that have been issued. It's important to note what the amendment does not do. It does not uh, address specifically the acceptance of consular identification cards, nor does, nor does it prohibit the issuance of the cards. Rather, it places, I believe, appropriate controls on their issuance uh, that uh, are currently unregulated but widely accepted in this country. And so I would uh, ask for the committee to consider this important piece of uh, legislation, given the uh, security concerns and law enforcement. Thank you very much, Mr. Hostetler. We appreciate that. And obviously, our national security is of paramount importance. That. I regularly argue is, uh, is why we're here. It's the one thing that the federal government uh, has to do because virtually everything else that we do can be handled by other levels of government. Uh, but I do know that there are a, a wide range of views as to how to best deal with uh, security on this issue. I've heard from a number of our colleagues on it, but I appreciate your coming forward and offering your thoughts. Mr. Goss? I agree. It's an important issue. Thank you. Mr. McGovern? Mr. Linder? Mr. Hastings? Mr. Hastings, thank you very much for being here, John. Thank we you, appreciate it. Our next witness is the uh, gentlewoman from Guam, uh, Ms. Bordayo. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you again. Welcome back to the uh, Rules Committee. And uh, without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record. We'd welcome a summary. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Dreyer and distinguished members of this committee. I come before you today to bring equity between the State Department employees from Guam with those from the mainland United States. Specifically, current law prohibits the State Department from reimbursing the travel costs of a dependent of an employee returning home if that place of residence happens to be a territory or a possession of the United States, such as Guam. This problem is brought about because Title V U.S. Code 59242B says the United States. We here know that the United States includes Guam and the other insular areas. That is why I'm sitting here today. But unfortunately, the underlying definition of the United States in Title V does not mention U.S. territories and possessions. This precludes the State Department from being able to cover the travel expenses of employees from Guam or any of the insular areas when they return home from a foreign area posting. My amendment would include the territories and possessions within the geographic definition of the United States. This would bring parity between employees from the U.S. territories and possessions and those from the mainland United States. This approach is in line with past legislative practices of not amending the underlying definition, but rather addressing its applicability within this specific provision only. Let me close, Mr. Chairman, by giving you a real example of the problem the current language imposes. A constituent of mine who is proudly serving our nation as a State Department employee in Beijing wanted to send his son home to school. This request was denied. And I have here in my possession a letter from the State Department's Office of Allowances saying, and let me quote, quote, based on the definition of the United States, the University of Guam is not considered a U.S. school. 
The State Department, Mr. Chairman, has no right representing the people of Guam, let alone employing them if that is their thinking. And I'm sure this is just an oversight which could be corrected. I just came here from discussing on the floor how we can increase federal agricultural research grants to the University of Guam. Mr. Chairman, the University of Guam is an American school. Guam is part of the United States, and this amendment should be considered. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Ms. Berdaya. We appreciate your thoughts, and uh, thank you for coming up here, Mr. Goss. I can't say what you're going to Mr. McGovern? I just want to thank the gentlelady for her testimony, and I strongly support her amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Linder? Mr. Hastings? Mr. Chairman, I consider it to be very reasonable and would urge that um, legislation generally that uh, does um, uh, what Ms. Bodile uh, uh, brings to our attention uh, should be corrected as well. It's offensive, quite frankly, that the State Department would take that kind of position. And uh, with that in mind, I'm hopeful that this amendment is made in order and that Ms. Bodile and others pursue corrective legislation throughout uh, uh, the realm that may avoid that kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, undertaking on behalf of uh, our, our government officials. Thank you, Ms. Thank Berdaya. you very much. Mr. Hastings, thank you very much again for being here, Ms. Berdaya. We thank appreciate you, Mr. your Chairman. testimony. Thank you. Uh, our next witness is uh, my California colleague, Mr. Rohrbacher, whom I've called on three times, and uh, we're happy that you were able to uh, Join us, and let me say that without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record in their entirety, and we welcome your summary. Yeah, I, I apologize for being late. I actually came directly from the airport, and I did catch the earliest flight from California uh, to Washington to be here. Uh, I appreciate the. Uh, you said that, uh, you were, you were missed at the uh, commissioning I had an important offshore board meeting that was taking place. Uh, this weekend. I appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, uh, and the making of my amendment in order to the Foreign Relations Appropriations Bill. My staff has submitted two versions of the amendment. Uh, the version which I prefer to move forward is on the second and shorter version labeled uh, number 32. Uh, this amendment is in essence uh, what I successfully offered and was passed through the International Relations Committee. And uh, even though the Armed Services Committee voted to remove it from the bill, so he did pass it through international relations, but unfortunately, Armed Services took it out of the bill. It simply says that the President shall have the authority to set easier rules for the exporting of satellites to our allies and to countries that are considered our allies uh, rather than uh, as compared to those countries that are not and that are unfriendly countries. Uh, let me make it clear, Mr. Chairman, that this amendment does not, NOT, not open the door uh, to any easier treatment for technology exports to countries that may be deemed enemies or potential adversaries or enemies of the United States, for example, Communist China or any other country that might potentially be unfriendly to the United States in the future. It permits the President uh, to have easier standards on those countries that are in alliance with us and that are recognized by the President as longtime friends of the United States. Uh, I would appreciate the Rules Committee respecting the actions of the International Relations Committee uh, and making this amendment in order. Uh, and. Uh, I would uh, let me just suggest that uh, I know this is going to cause the same kind of debate that we were in on the computer bill, only uh, I will be on this side this time because I don't we had a disagreement on whether or not the type of uh, restrictions that uh, are necessary for our country's security uh, were on that computer bill. But there's no question about this. Mm -hmm. This would only open the door, only open the door for countries that are friendly and not potential mm -hmm. adversaries. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate your thoughts on it, Mr. Goss. Well, that's a good subject. Uh, Mr. McGovern? Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions, but I'd like to also ask at this time unanimous consent to insert in the record a statement by Carolyn Maloney in support of her amendments. Without objection, Ms. Maloney's statement will uh, appear in the record. Mr. Linder? No Mr. Hastings? No Thank you, Mr. Hastings? Thank you very much for being here, Dana. We Thank appreciate you very your much, Dana. 
thoughts. Our next witness is the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. We're happy to have you. Please uh, come forward, and without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record in their entirety. And we would, uh, the committee would welcome a summary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and I will be brief. Uh, this amendment recognizes the plight of Jewish refugees who were expelled from Arab countries in the years leading up to and immediately after the establishment of the State of Israel. Many people are not aware, aware that during the years following uh, the establishment of Israel, more Jews than Arabs became refugees. In fact, there are estimated to be about 900,000 Jews who were stripped of their property and expelled from Arab countries and about 600,000 of those were absorbed and assimilated into Israel, and the remaining 300,000 fled to a lot of other countries, including the United States. Um, they lost everything, their property, their possessions, their homes, whatever. Until now, the debate um, has, in terms of refugees in, in the, the Middle East has focused primarily on the plight of Palestinian refugees and the question of the right of return, and essentially what this resolution does, or this amendment does, I should say, is to ask that future peace negotiations and discussions uh, specifically on the rights of refugees should address both sides of the issue, both Arab and Jewish. And um, I, I just want to say that um, Congresswoman Ileana ross Layton is very supportive of this. Uh, we actually had a hearing be before her subcommittee, the Middle East subcommittee, on the issue, which I thought was a very good hearing. And what the amendment, we're not only asking that their plight be considered in the context of any negotiations but also that uh, Congress essentially recognized the fact that there are a number of organizations working to, working to document the history and the registry of the Jewish refugees from Arab countries and that they should be commended and continue to, uh, to be uh, in their activities. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Pallone. You've made it very clear. Mr. Goss? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Govern? I support the gentleman's amendment. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Linder? No Mr. Hastings? Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much for being here, Mr. Paul. We certainly appreciate it. Our next witness is uh, the distinguished chairman of the Subcommittee on Trade, our friend from Illinois, Mr. Crane. Please uh, feel free to enter into the uh, record. Any remarks without objection will appear there, and we'd welcome a summary. Nice to have you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this amendment that I have incorporates the text of legislation H. Con Res 119 that I introduced this past March. This amendment offers Congress's condolences to the loved ones of 42 innocent Americans who have been killed in Israel and calls on the Palestinian Authority to work with Israel to protect all innocent people, regardless of citizenship, from terrorist violence. It recognizes the 42 Americans by listing those killed and the circumstances surrounding their deaths. A woman from New York City was the most recent American killed by Palestinian terrorists. Ms. Goldstein was shot and killed while driving through the West Bank just last month on June the 20th. Another 79 Americans have been injured in Palestinian terrorist attacks. On June 25, 2003, the House of Representatives passed H. Conrez 294, which expressed the sympathy of the House to the families of innocent Israelis and Palestinians who have lost their lives during the conflict. I believe that it's appropriate for Congress to also recognize the Americans who have been killed by terrorists in that same conflict. The State Department currently does not list all of the attacks on Americans in Israel on their annual list of terrorist attacks overseas. This amendment will make the American public more aware of the harm coming to our citizens overseas and show the surviving families that Congress knows and cares about the deaths of their loved ones. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Crane. We appreciate your testimony, and thanks for being here, Mr. Goss. Mr. McGovern? Mr. Linder? Mr. Hastings? Mr. Hastings? Thank you very much for being here, Thank Phil. You we all. appreciate it very much. Our next witness is the uh, gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Kennedy. He's not coming. Uh, and I understand that Mr. Colby is uh, en route. Should be here any minute. Uh, Mr. Emanuel is our next witness. Let me just uh, inform the uh, committee members what we're planning to do as far as our schedule is, uh, is concerned. We have uh, sailed through this hearing, as you can tell, uh, in a very efficient manner, and we appreciate the understanding of the members of the committee. And uh, 
You know that we're scheduled to bring up H.R. Uh, 2691, the Department of Interior and Related Agencies Appropriations Act. The chairman and the ranking minority member are not expected to, I don't know if they have airplanes or the exigency of their schedule of uh, created a situation where they won't be able to uh, be here until 5.30. So it's my intention to, as soon as we hear from uh, Mr. Colby and uh, Mr. Emanuel, if he arrives, is to recess the committee. And then I know we, uh, I know we have votes scheduled for, I don't know what time, 6.30 or so? We have votes scheduled on the floor at 6.30, so it's my intention to recess the committee and then we'll reconvene for consideration of the Interior Appropriations Bill at 5.30. Uh, so, uh, I guess I'm waiting for our... Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, is, is it this, your Mr. expectation Governor. that we might actually be able to report a rule out before the votes begin on both these bills? Well, it depends on what happens uh, on that measure. Um, you know, we will try to do that, but I, ca I can't uh, provide you assurance that we will. <laughs> there is uh, no one else here, uh, and so what I'm going to do then is, rather than asking everyone to stay, I think we'll uh, recess the committee and say that if there are any statements that members wish to include in the record uh, from their testimony, we certainly will do that. So the and committee, and uh, if I, if uh, I Mr. McGovern, ask your please. consent to insert the statement of Robert Menendez. Without objection, the statement of uh, Mr. Menendez will appear in the record. And so uh, the uh, committee stands in recess until approximately 5.30, at which time we will hear from the chairman and the ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations, uh, the Subcommittee on Interior Appropriations. Thank you all very much. Okay. When the Rules Committee reconvened, they finished work on State Department programs, then turned to rules for debate on interior spending. That bill authorizing State Department programs for 04 and 05 makes its way to the House floor tomorrow. You can see the U.S. House live on our companion network, C-SPAN. Now available at cspan.org. C-SPAN's 2003 Congressional Directory. It's your guide to following the 108th Congress. Inside, you'll find a complete